Uh, now, before, uh, before we get into, uh, into the research, I just wanted to kick off uh, and talk a little bit about why it was that we commissioned this study. Uh, and it really, it, it comes back uh, to this chart uh, that came out, the brilliant analysis uh, from um, Peter Field uh, and Les Burnett uh, using the, that, that, the incredibly rich resource of the IPA data bank. Uh, and what it shows is a really worrying and disturbing picture uh, that our advertising is becoming less effective. Uh, and Les and Peter, within this analysis, um, highlight some of the reasons behind what is driving this. So, first of all, we've got short-termism. Uh, we're seeing that the number of campaigns that are less than six months in duration, that are planned and executed uh, in a less than a six-month period, have grown to nearly 25% from only being you know, under 10% um, uh, uh, about 10 years ago. So we're just getting more short-term in, in the nature in terms of how we're planning and how we're executing campaigns. Um, as a result, result, what we're seeing is that we're moving away from the optimal mix of brand and activation from 60-40. Uh, in 2016, the split was more like 50-50 in terms of brand versus activation. Uh, and this is a, a, a result of this increasing move towards short-termism. We're also seeing a misuse of, of ROI, and we've got a lot more to, to come on this later uh, from Ubiquity and Gain Theory's presentation. But um, uh, the essence of it uh, is that through short-term campaigns that are purely focused about speaking to people in market, speaking to people who are the lowest hanging fruit only, uh, we can see really high levels of return on investment. Um, but the impact when it comes to long-term um, overall business growth and profitability is a lot smaller, and we need to think about how we use our ROI. Um, and then finally, we're also seeing that use of extra share of voice is in free fall. Um, so this is spending a uh, share of voice above our market share in order to drive growth. Uh, and this has massively come down over the last 10 years. And it's not just about short-termism. Um, if we just look at the long-term cases uh, alongside this, we can see that they are also not using extra share of voice as a means to grow their businesses. Uh, so we're not putting the money behind our campaigns that we need to in order to drive um, proper effectiveness. Uh, this was then followed up by a report from, from Enders, uh, a brilliant report commissioned by uh, Magnetic, um, uh, which, which dug into the reasons behind why um, we, you know, we're seeing this drive towards short-termism. Uh, and what we're looking at here is some of the underlying causes being the short tenure of marketing directors. We're seeing incredibly high incentives um, for, for MDs and executives based on very short-term targets and goals. Um, we're, we're also uh, over-reliant on attribution modeling um, and short-term data in order to optimize our plans and losing sight of the longer-term picture. Um, uh, the rise in control of the procurement teams is having an impact uh, because we're focusing more on cost than we are on effectiveness. Uh, and also they found that this growth in DR advertising, growth in activation advertising at the expense of brand building. So, you know, this is quite a, you know, a depressing and a worrying backdrop. So what we wanted to do was commission a study that highlighted just how powerful advertising can be to build on this brilliant work uh, from, from Les and Peter um, and uh, build an understanding of the right way to, uh, to drive growth, to drive effectiveness. Um, and um, our core goals with this study um, are to focus on both the ability to drive profit in the short term. We are well aware that you know, these goals are real. Businesses have to achieve their short-term targets. But how can we do this and also secure long-term business growth for our, for our brands? Um, clearly, as a trade body for TV, we, we were confident in the role that TV was going to play uh, in, in effectiveness, and then we wanted to highlight uh, TV's role within this. Um, we also wanted to do more to start speaking the language of the boardroom. Uh, we wanted to help build the bridge between marketing and finance so that we can make sure that advertising is seen as an investment and not just a cost. Um, and we also wanted to uh, cover off and touch on this um, use of ROI and ensure that we can use ROI in, in, in the right way. So uh, this is where Ubiquity and Gain Theory uh, came in. And you know, um, they were the perfect, uh, perfect people to work on this study because it is in their DNA to be media neutral. Um, and they have an existing 
a very rich data bank uh, of econometric studies that uh, just need to be looked at, that need to be averaged. We are not asking them to start to build anything from scratch. We are just taking their existing analysis of how advertising works um, and looking at this so that we can drive some benchmarks on what we can expect advertising to deliver for different types of category. Um, and also, this kind of data bank uh, is a view of the average case. Uh, this is not cherry-picking the best examples of when advertising works at its best. We are looking at the average performance across a really large data set um, of brands. So um, um, without further ado, it's time for me to hand over um, to uh, Ubiquiti and to Gain Theory. We're going to kick off um, uh, with uh, Andrew Shalia. Uh, the client relations director. Um, so Andrew's previously worked uh, on the client side for Marks and Spencers. He also worked on the consultant side for Nina Consulting. Uh, so he's perfect place to build this bridge uh, between marketing and finance. Uh, Nick Pugh, um, who is uh, director of, uh, head of effectiveness at Ubiquiti, he has a, a, a PhD in optimization. So I don't really need to explain where his expertise sits. Um, and they're going to take you through their findings in terms of what we can see advertising delivering in the short term. They are then going to hand over to Matt Chappell from Game Theory, who's going to talk through their understanding of how uh, advertising works in the long term. Uh, and then it's going to come back to Ubiquiti, uh, who are going to sort of round up the total view of what we can expect advertising to deliver. Uh, so um, Matt is um, he's partner at Game Theory. He's got eight years of experience. Uh, he's working with clients across FMCG, retail, uh, and finance. Uh, so Andrew and Nick, it's over to you. Let's all hope the microphone's working. Uh, good morning, and lovely to see some uh, familiar faces in the audience. Uh, for those of you who don't know Ubiquity, a quick introduction. We're an independent media and marketing consultancy, and we help clients make better or better informed media and marketing choices and media and marketing investment decisions. Now, that's one introduction. I'm going to talk about the application of responsible ROI. And my second introduction is to this chap. This is a groundhog, for those who aren't uh, uh, David Attenborough. Uh, we can call him Phil. Uh, every February the 2nd, thousands of people gather at Gobbler's Knob, make sure I got that right, in Puxatawney, Pennsylvania, to await a special forecast from a groundhog named Phil. If the 20-pound groundhog emerges and sees his shadow, the United States can expect more weeks of winter weather. If he emerges and doesn't see his shadow, we're going to have a great spring, and it's an early arrival of spring. Now, he's been doing the forecasting since 1887. And if we look at the last 10 years, he's been right 50% of the time. <laughs> Unfortunately, serious point, but too much planning is still driven by the equivalent of pulling Phil out to measure his shadow. <laughs> and that includes the selective or simplistic use and application of ROI numbers. And if that sounds quite extreme, how else do you explain the sort of current wailing and gnashing of teeth, the sort of hangover about so-called wasted digital investment, when companies like Ubiquity, and not just Ubiquity, have been sounding the alarm bells on some of these, uh, uh, these issues for the last few years. Good planning requires rigor. It requires numbers, but it requires numbers which are treated responsibly. Hurricane Irma was not survivable without planning. But under pan underpinning the planning was sound forecasting and sound modeling. If we can trust a model to predict the path of a hurricane and potentially save lives, surely a model which helps us predict the brand and business outcomes from media investment is a good starting point. A fundamental output from the modeling that takes place for, uh, on media investment, econometric modeling, etc., is the ROI. And this is a key number that we need to understand when planning investment going forward, but it needs to be properly understood. 
And this is very different from simply saying, I've got an ROI, therefore I'm going to invest in that channel. Because in and of itself, ROI is a point on a diminishing returns curve. Now, when we were talking with Thinkbox about this uh, presentation, I did say, well, surely most people understand that. So for those who do understand that, I'm not hopefully teaching people to suck eggs, but let me just recap what I mean by the point on the diminishing returns curve. Here we see an investment along the bottom axis of 5,000 or five returning uh, about 40. I think something went slightly wrong in the lining up of the lines, but that, take it uh, as read, is an ROI of eight to one. So you invest five and you get eight back. The easiest way to increase ROI is actually to reduce spend. So if we invest two and we get 20, we have an ROI of 10 to one, which as we all know is better than eight to one. But there's no point in having a big ROI, whether it's 10 to one or eight to one, if you cannot scale it. And scaling ROI is absolutely crucial because if all you can spend is five, then you can't get very far. You need to be able to spend 500, 5,000, 500,000, 5 million in order to get a, a, a proper return. And businesses, we should all be interested in what we'd call scalable ROI. ROI which delivers significant returns in volume. So today, we're going to talk about, and Nick will pick this up after uh, I've finished, about responsible ROI. And that's responsible ROI applied to all media channels, offline and online. Now, given the nature of this event, somewhat inevitably, we are going to see where TV sits within the world of responsible ROI. And I don't think, uh, to use a BAFTA analogy, we're going to spoil the end of the film by knowing that TV is obviously going to play a significant role in that. So we need to start with the ROI model, not the ROI number. A typical econometric model is like an iceberg. Incremental sales above the surface, so those are the short to medium term effects, and brand and sales momentum lying beneath the surface. Herein lie longer term effects. This is the world of base sales. Businesses can and should obsess about the base as much as they do the incremental. The issue, and the issue to short-termism, is the incremental is often what pays the bonus and drives the share price. Only once we, we know the short and long-term effects can we work out the associated ROI the diminish, and the diminishing returns associated with that, and only then can we move on to optimization. Now, optimization is another word that gets somewhat abused or misused or misunderstood. The principle of optimization is that of efficient choices. What is the most time efficient or cost efficient way of accomplishing a task or a goal? Which is why it's good to have people like Dr. Nick around to help us. By the way, the China Post reference is the, the challenge of optimizing the Chinese postman's route when he's delivering thousands of letters is one of the uh, sort of things that one learns about when studying optimization theory. Um, I am reliably informed. When we think in media terms, Optimization is about understanding the point at which you start hitting diminishing returns in one media channel before you simply jump to the next, and so on and so on. Now, some of you will have heard about hill climbing algorithms, and Matt made a reference to it in his opening. Uh, it's the principle of this picture. Before the slope becomes too steep, you jump to the next hill down. Uh, so the next time anybody mentions a hill climbing algorithm, you'll know what they are talking about before you slap their face and tell them not to be so boring. Um, 
The point about all of this is you need to do this in terms of the short term, the, the, the near distance, and your long-term goals. So responsible ROI is about three things. ROI, which focuses on profit, but profit at scale. Short and long-term measurement and optimization for brand and business growth. Great. Um, clearly, I have been built up as a very cool kind of guy, um, and I'm not going to do my image any further cred by the next set of slides I'm about to, to uh, show you. So, as Matt was saying up front, it's going to be about bubble charts, it's going to be about bar charts, and it's going to be about interquartal ranges, so uh, enjoy. Um, so, in all seriousness, um, I guess the, the core of this study um, was a compilation of all the learnings and all the data from our clients. And we have built up uh, a pretty comprehensive uh, campaign level database uh, where we have fused together two key sources of information. So the data, the input data, so things such as spends, ratings, audience group, and so on, uh, obviously timings, uh, alongside the business outcome data, so that would be the likes of the effectiveness, so if uplifts as a result of the investments, uh, return on investment data, uh, and, and, and halo rates. Uh, in terms of the composition of that database, as I said, it's, it's, it's pretty exhaustive. It's based on uh, about 150 advertisers, uh, spanning the last three years of, of, of work with those clients, so between February 14 and May 17. Uh, that covers uh, over 10 sectors. And actually, that then amounts to nearly 2,000 campaign observations. And what underpins that is the very glamorous world of econometrics, statistical modeling, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit more detail uh, in a moment. But this work then builds upon the, the previous iterations of the work that we've done with Thinkbox in, in 2014 uh, and 2011. Uh, within those campaign observations, obviously, we have different amounts uh, of a number of data points by channel, obviously biased according to the level of spends and the utilization of those channels. But the data is there for, for all to see. So obviously, TV dominates because it is still a big portion uh, of the spend. Uh, one flag at the bottom of that chart we do mention in terms of social media. Obviously, as a result of the work that we do with our clients, we are measuring the investment in social to business outcome. In terms of, you know, this is a norms-based longitudinal study, so in terms of the number of data points we have at our disposal, it's not quite right to present a norms number at this stage. So as a bit of housekeeping, and to get everyone on the same page, uh, a bit of definition uh, and a bit of clarity, uh, we will be presenting you with online video data. Um, that is an amalgam uh, of broadcaster VOD, uh, social VOD, uh, a YouTube, um, PPC, obviously PPC is a very, very important part of the investment uh, pie. Um, we do measure it as a result of the work that we do do, uh, but its role is slightly different to the awareness driving media that we're going to talk about uh, today. As I said, in terms of social media, we're not going to be presenting uh, a definitive number. We'll provide, provide you with a directional number in a moment, um, but we do indirectly uh, include it within the data via the likes of video on demand uh, and online display. And then finally, um, obviously we are at mercy of our client base. We're at mercy about the spend activities and tactics of those clients. The distribution of spend, and there will be some charts a little later, may differ to some of the, the industry uh, top line numbers, for example, the ones published by, by Walk. So excitingly, what underpins this and underpins our campaign database is data and, and also mathematical modeling type techniques. So, so the most popular here would be econometrics. It's a very well-established uh, methodology which takes uh, a brand's trading history through time, identifies the key drivers' performance, identifies the scale of those key drivers, uh, and then measures uh, effectiveness and efficiency metrics off the back end of that, so return investments, uplifts, uh, and so on. 
So within that, we are measuring the role of media, but not, it's not only about media. Um, it's also about all the other factors that could be driving business performance through time. And ultimately, it's about identifying what works, what doesn't, what to do more of, what to do less of, and using that information in a forward-facing capacity then to help businesses grow uh, in the future. As Andrew said up front, um, ROI-led planning should be done in a responsible manner where you factor in scale. But just for the fun of it, let's talk about irresponsible ROI for a second, where irresponsible ROI takes ROI and only ROI in, in isolation. To start us off, let's give you a view in terms of how TV profit ROI is performing across the latest snapshot of data that we've got available to us. So as it currently stands, for every pound that's invested, there is a 173 profit return. So that's 73 pence incremental above and beyond that investment. In terms of comparisons to the previous work that we've done with Thinkbox, that compares to 179, which we reported back in 2014, and 170 that was reported back in 2011. And as a bit of context, obviously we've seen ROI go down slightly. There naturally has been inflation in the market. If we look across the last two snapshots, so 14 to 16, 17, and 11 to 14, there has been a 13% CPT inflation if we think about the all, audience, uh, all adults uh, audience. As uh, Matt and Andrew said up front, obviously we're interested to understand how TV is performing in relation to, to the other media lines uh, within the media landscape. And here we go. So as I said up front, um, or a couple of slides back, the TV profit ROI is 173. It is still the most efficient uh, media line. And then that compares to uh, the likes of radio and print, uh, which is performing relatively well. Online video is above break even. And then we have online display and at home, which is in the short to medium term, I emphasize, uh, below uh, break even. So they are ROI numbers. The ROI numbers are fairly blunt. And as Andrew was saying, they are points on a curve. We're also interested to understand what is the level of risk involved in investment in advertising and investment in particular media channels. And particularly from a CF CFO's perspective, that would be a key question uh, for those individuals. So I'm going to talk about, um, oh, actually, apologies, one other thing, which is a build, um, which is just to show that we are considering social media. Um, the ROI for social media comes in at 114. But as I said, up front, it's based on a low number of data points. Uh, and as a result of that, they should be treated directionally um, rather than exhaustively. Now, level of risk. Um, talk about in interquartile ranges. Actually, out of interest, how many of you remember back at school the principle of an interquartile range? <laughs> yes, it is a glamorous subject. It's probably kind of Friday afternoon uh, in the maths room. Um, right, so... Good job, I've got a few slides to explain it. So, as I said, the ROI data we presented so far have be, has been fairly blunt. We are keen to establish the level of risk involved in investment, and this is what we're gonna do through an interquartile range. So, interquartile range as a definition is if you had a, a range or a, a, all the data points at your disposal and put them in rank order, the interval quarter range will be the one that sits uh, between the 25th centile and the, the 75th centile. So it's kind of the middle portion of data. The advantage of doing that, it does remove the outliers. It removes the extremes. You kind of understand is what is the middle part. So to put that into context, if we look at advertising as a whole, that interquarter range ranges between just over 50p in the pound at the lower quartile position, and then close to two pound return at the upper quartile <coughs> position. So as a guide, the shorter the bar, the higher the certainty, the higher the bar, um, the greater the payback. I'm going to build further. 
Within our database, we are also going to publish the maximum profit ROI numbers presented. So for advertising as a whole, that comes in as 1296. And again, I emphasize in the short to medium term. We also have that break even line. And to build upon that, we're also going to publish the percentage of the data points that sit above that break even line. So again, for advertising as a whole, and in a moment for the channels uh, that we've reviewed for this study. So, taking a step back in terms of those interquarter ranges, the key takeout, first of all, is that TV, that red bar, sits higher than the others. So, a headline would be, is that TV provides the safest place uh, to put your pounds. <coughs> and then we overlay that then with the maximum observed return investment data. It's probably not going to be much of a shock in terms of the maximum observed across advertising a whole of 1296. That actually comes from TV. And then we have the likes of radio and print coming in between five and six pounds. Uh, but then some good contributions from the likes of online video, uh, online display, and out of home. To build further, in terms of uh, the, the number or the percentage of observations that sit above that break even line, we said for advertising as a whole, that sat at 58%. So 58% of the, the dead points were, were profitable. We compare that to TV, and TV is at 70%. So every seven in 10 um, ROIs uh, are above break even and therefore are profitable at the bottom line to the businesses that we are dealing with. And then we compare that then across the other media lines. Um, radio uh, at 62, uh, print at 61, online video of 52, uh, and then we have uh, online display and at home at slightly lower levels. I hope that's been a good education in terms of interquarter ranges. Okay, so let's introduce the sector dimension and understand how TV is operating across a cohort of uh, key sectors. So we have retail at 271, financial services 235, travel at 516, and we have some others like energy, and then we have FMCGs. So the takeout in the short to medium term is that TV generally does very well in terms of driving profitable payback. There is one exception, which is FMCG. Now, I think it's fair to say, hold that thought, and let's link that directly to what Matt and the Game Theory guy is gonna talk about a little later. As a bit of context, obviously you can see the likes of retail, financial services, uh, the ROI is strong, but we tend to find that ROI does reward scale. And uh, the bigger you are uh, as a business, often the bigger the return on investment. And if you think about the likes of retail and the likes of financial services, there are some pretty big, big businesses that sit within those sectors. And therefore, it does help to amplify uh, the return investment numbers accordingly. Now, one key takeout really with this would be like to travel. So obviously, there are some big businesses sitting within that sector. ROI 516 is simply phenomenal when this is a short to medium term return. The other thing to flag is we tend to find that uh, consumers within the travel sector are very sensitive to, to advertising stimuli. So that, alongside pretty big businesses, results in a very, very strong ROI picture. Okay, so that was the irresponsible ROI, where we plan only according to an ROI number, but does not take into account scale. So this then leads us on to the next part of the study, which is regarding responsible ROI, where we do consider scale. <clears throat> As Matt said earlier on, we were going to hit you with some diminished returns curves or profit return. What this chart uh, is or demonstrates, as you kind of go up the spend levels, it gives you an idea in terms of what the profit return is by spend level, by channel. Now, the key takeout here is that that red line is TV. And TV is delivering strong return at high levels of, of spend. which then neatly takes us on to the next slide, which is, apologies, it is a fairly busy slide. Um, 
is three-dimensional um, chart which uh, plots the percentage of budget or percentage of spend within a campaign by channel, uh, the short-term profit ROI on the y-axis, and then the bubbles represent um, the, the share of the return, the sales return, the profit return, uh, within a typical campaign. So at a total level, you can see that TV fares very well. And goes back to what Andrew said a little earlier on, is that TV does deliver strong ROI, but it does deliver a very strong ROI at scale, which is a very, very important takeout. So uh, according to our data, uh, just under two-thirds of the, the share of the return is linked back to TV, and that compares to about 53% share of budget. So it is performing very, very efficiently as well at that level of, uh, of investment. Then we drill down by sector. Um, so first of all, FMCG. So FMCG traditionally has been mainly about television. It's mainly been about developing the brand. Um, when we presented back in 2014, it was a very, very similar story. Uh, you can see that TV utterly dominates. But if you think about the dynamics at play within FMCG, it's possibly not much of a surprise, where the success of a campaign does depend on reach. The success of a campaign does depend on the recruitment of lighter consumers into the brand and helps to boost the return investment, which TV does in abundance. The red bubble there for TV, um, the share of spend is about 75%, pretty high number, and it does deliver about 85% of the share of, of the return. We branch out to other sectors, the likes of financial services. Again, the story is similar, but not as extreme. TV is at about 54% share, um, delivering about six, sorry, share of budget, delivering about 66% share of return. Notable mentions would be the likes of print, radio, and online video. The one thing to flag, if you saw on the previous charts, so if I go back one and talk about FMCG, where in the short to medium term, payback generally is a challenge, for financial services, all the bubbles move up. Uh, on the y-axis. We think about radio, where actually every single bubble is above break-even. There's a consistency with the TV story, but I think it's probably worth a mention on the role of radio within this particular sector. The ROI for radio is, is very strong. It's just over three pounds. Um, it, there has been a, a nice movement, particularly over the last few years within, within that space, where radio advertising is, is, is building on some of the audio cues that we are seeing in some of the, the TV campaigns. And they are some uh, promotional kind of conversion type messaging. So therefore, there's, a, there's definitely an amplification effect that's existing for radio within retail that's building upon some of the TV assets. And then for completeness, uh, we talk about travel, as we said earlier on. TV ROI in the travel sector is, is very strong indeed. That can be echoed across a number of the media lines. It's very, very effective, very efficient. And again, that red bubble tells a story about a, a very nice ratio between the share of budget uh, and the share of, of return within, within a campaign. Okay, so let's build upon that. <clears throat> there's been mentions of hill climbing, there's been mentions of optimization uh, it is an area which uh, I, I do enjoy. Um, um, but the next lo logical step here is to look at TV investment as it currently stands and understand whether there is a right sizing to be done. So is there a, a tweak of the dial that could be done uh, for TV investment? So a bit earlier on, we talked about response curves or, or, or profit return curves, which is that relationship between spend and profit. At an aggregate level, at a channel level and a sector level, we've, we've constructed curves that takes all our client data into account. 
those curves then give us the, almost the engine room uh, to be able to arrive at a optimized allocation uh, of budget uh, by sector. Now, what I would say um, is that this is a maths-led approach. This is almost a kind of a pure science approach. And the way that we tend to work with clients, th this should act as a start point uh, for the budget discussions to understand what the general kind of shape of the plan should look like. There's clearly another layer of this where there are other priorities and other considerations that need to be taken into account. Um, so planning pragmatism, uh, creative vision, et cetera, et cetera. So it's clearly a fusion between this and what ends up uh, finally on that plan. So earlier on, I showed you the, the response curves. Let's think about the inverse of that. Let's understand what the marginal ROI curve looks like. So a marginal ROI curve would be a relationship between spend on that x-axis and the marginal ROI that you get for increasing your spend. So what is the marginal benefit of spending a bit more, a lot more, a bit less, a lot less? And you can do that for TV, and then you can do that for the other media lines as well. So again, in terms of the chart I showed you on, which was almost the reverse of this, where the red line was above uh, some of the other media channels, Obviously, the inverse would tell the same story, where the marginal benefit of spending TV uh, is quite uh, is favourable. Now, key thing to take out here is if you look to the left-hand side of that chart, you can see that the marginal ROI of that red line is above some of the other lines, which would indicate that investment in TV at lower levels of spend is the right place. Let's take that one step further and hopefully try to bring it to life a little bit in terms of some of the uh, hill climbing th uh, thinking. If you, you've got two red dots on that chart, anything between the first red dot and the, and the second red dot, the marginal ROI of going from zero to, th say, about 3.6 million in this case, is more favorable to invest in TV. So I think anything to the left is TV, anything to the right, then actually the steepness or the hill of the other curves becomes a more attractive proposition. So in any kind of pure maths-led approach, it would opt out of TV and then go into the other media lines. The ambition is across a total level of spend, so you know, for example, it could be 10 million, what is kind of the sweet spot of allocation across the different uh, media lines? So we're gonna take these curves and put them into practice and to understand what is the appropriate level of investment behind TV within a kind of typical standard campaign across uh, a few key sectors. So the next set of charts we're going to publish will be a set of bar charts, shock horror. It's going to be a set of ROI indices, and the charts will demonstrate um, how campaign ROI changes as the percentage of budget behind TV changes. So. Um, to bring this to life a little bit, let's think about FMCG. So um, on the, on the y-axis, we have, as I said, the index campaign ROI. 100 is the maximum observed uh, return investment number. The bar charts represent what is that index campaign ROI at different levels of share of TV within the campaign, ranging from 10% up to 100%. In terms of current status, it's about, uh, TV is about 75% share of spend. When we run the optimizations, uh, and based on the bubble charts that I showed you on where TV does dominate, it's not going to be much of a shock where there is a recommendation that TV spend should increase or could increase. We do the same for financial services where the current share is about 54. The recommendation is to move it closer to about 60, between 60 and 70. On a slight uh, converse to that, if you think about retail, I think about the story at all about some of the media lines performing quite well. There is a suggestion that uh, right size investment moves from about 55 to 50, but hold that thought, and we, when we, particularly when we're wrapping the long term um, game, uh, game theory slides uh, a little later. And then to complete the story within travel, uh, current share of spend is about 40. Again, the ROI story is very healthy within, within the sector. 
TV in particular, the recommendation is to push spend north of the current levels. So that's it for the top part of the iceberg. So going back to Andrew's analogy, we've kind of covered off the incremental part, but clearly there's a, a bit beneath the surface, the mass, which is about the long term and the base and brand momentum. At that juncture, I'll hand over to Matt to take you through the long term multipliers. Thank you very much, um, Nick. Now, I'm Matt Chappell. We're from, well, I am, not we. There's no one else on the stage. I am from Game Theory, um, and we are a marketing foresight consultancy. What that means is that we work with marketers and their businesses looking at data and analytics to understand how they can make faster, smarter, future-faced business decisions. Now, how this all plays out into the long term you know, what we need to do is we need to listen to our clients and to understand exactly their pain points, understand exactly what they're looking for, and understand the right kind of data and methodology to look at to help them to achieve their goals. And so we need to find the right methodology for the right thing, otherwise known as kind of everything in its right place. Now, for those of you with eagle eyes, you'll notice I've missed the E. Now, that's not my decision. That was Tom York's decision back in 2001, um, so I'm going to keep it that way. Now. What we know about everything in its right place is there are a number of methodologies and techniques that you can use to get a really good insight and definition of short-term, very granular success. So if you look at things like spot matching, attribution, A-B testing, they're all absolutely fantastic at going really deep into particular media types, and they're fantastic at getting you very quick answers, but they are, by their very definition, short-termist. When you look at other techniques like econometrics and, and stuff that Nick was talking about, you know, that's the kind of stuff that moves you into the weeks and months rather than the hours and days. But a lot of the questions our clients were asking us was about long-term success. Now, we know that procurement and the board are not the enemy. Um, if anything, we need to find a way of getting between marketing and you know, the CMO and the CFO. And there is a load of research that says that currently both CMOs and CFOs feel that there's a disconnect there. We believe that one of the reasons that disconnect exists is because CFOs and also procurement are looking for numbers and fact-based uh, kind of calculations and workings, which means you need to find a way to bring numbers to the long term to show the CMO, to show the CFO and the CEO that it's not just about expecting jam tomorrow, but actually putting, it, putting some data and putting some solid techniques behind that um, to help them to achieve this. So this is where our kind of long-term studies come in. Now, Matt mentioned very helpfully at the start of the event that it was about unobserved component modeling. Now, you know, they're just three words. What they're basically looking at is, is the following, if I demonstrate. I'm going to start with Celine Dion. Now, there's been a lot of talk about icebergs, which is why what made me think of Celine Dion. Um, as you can see, my music takes pretty much stopped in 2001, so Celine Dion is, is still pretty relevant. <laughs> and if you like this one, there's a reference to Cliff Richard later that you're absolutely going to love. <laughs> Trust me. This short-termism, this focus on the easily measured, on attribution and spot matching, and as we saw from Matt's slides earlier, we believe is harming the bottom line. If you think about Jack and Rose on that iceberg, they could very easily see the top of the iceberg. And they could see that in a lot of detail as they were traveling towards it at speed. But they were only seeing 18% of that iceberg if they were viewing it through the lens of attribution modeling, which unfortunately didn't exist in 1912. Now, when they look through a short-term econometric view, they can see up to 42% of that iceberg, 42% of that real business effect. But it's only when you look at the whole iceberg, the bit above the water and the bit below the water, that you get 100% of the effect and of the impact, which means that by focusing on the short term, we're only understanding 42% of the way marketing is driving sales and the way advertising is driving sales. And we're not understanding the pure, brilliant impact that it's playing in the long term. So we, we want to find a way to give some numbers towards that and to try and understand the bottom of the iceberg. So rather than going to your CFO and saying, you know, there's some jam tomorrow, it's coming, trust me, or rather than using some of the academic figures that exist, such as advertising works three times as hard in the long term as it does in the short term, 
you know, that's not going to fly because our business is going to be very different to the academic businesses that they studied back in the study, which I think came out in the 90s. So we want to find a way that's different, that works for all our clients, and that has nuances based on the category that they're working in. We want to find a long-term methodology. Before we start, just a couple of definitions. The long-term is, in this case, three years. For some clients, we look longer than three years, up to five or six. But for the majority of our clients, this will be three years. Our long-term methodology is unobserved component modeling. I don't know about you. I've got somewhere I need to be tonight, so I can't spend the rest of the day explaining what unobserved component modeling is. However, Thinkbox have been lucky enough or have been uh, kind of foresighted enough to uh, take some films where Nick um, and myself explain some of the methodologies behind this. So if you are interested in the very precise and detailed methodology, that is on, on thinkbox.tv. The key factor for us is that long-term multiplier. And I'll go on to the long-term multiplier in a bit. But the long-term multiplier is the definition of how much of the impact we're going to see in the long-term versus the short-term. So if the long-term multiplier is 2, it means that our impact in the short term is multiplied by 2 when we look at the long term. A long-term multiplier of 1, just as definition, means that there's no additional long-term impact. So we can expect exactly the same in the long term as we just got in the short term. We've looked across categories and brands, and you know, we've got insights drawn out mainly from retail, financial services, and FMCG here. And so this is how it works in a tiny bit of detail, do you remember that other detail exists. <coughs> so the way standard econometrics works is we look at some media activity, and you know, we might have an eight-week burst of activity. We've got a, almost a predetermined flat base, and this is the stuff that exists under the iceberg. In standard econometrics, the theory is that, anything, that everything is mean reverting. So any activity that happens can cause a short-term spike and an uplift, but ultimately the sales go down to the base in the kind of medium to long term. So you can, might be able to see that this media activity has an impact. It rises up as the campaign uh, goes on, and then it falls away as the campaign stops. But ultimately, that base is going back to being flat. And really, we thought, does it make sense for that base to be flat over time? Should that base change as tastes and preferences change? Should that base change as customers become more loyal to the brand as, they, as we move up the consideration set? And so we developed the unobserved component methodology to understand how that base moves. So rather than having that burst of purple that then goes back to that flat line of gray, we have a burst of purple that then has a, a moving base over time. So we can see that that very much short-term burst has a long-term continuous impact. And when we look at this, we look across different campaigns different media types to understand how that long-term impact changes across industries, across media types, and across campaign types. So I know you're all probably itching for the results. So I've mentioned this before, and I'm not, not going to spend too long on it, uh, because I'm itching for the results as well. But the short-term ROI, let's say, for example, the way to read these long-term multipliers, let's say the short-term ROI is £1.50. If we have a long-term multiplier of 2, which is going to be on the, on the next chart you see, then the long-term ROI would be 3, which is the short-term ROI multiplied by the long-term multiplier. Now, that multiplier does not have to just be applied to ROI. It can be applied to profit levels, sales levels, any of the KPIs that you're measuring in the short term. So how does it work? Now, bear in mind, I mentioned that the base of this chart is 1, which means that there's no additional impact in the long term. When we look at across all categories, what we see is the long-term multiplier is just short of two. And this is all categories and all media types. That means a short-term ROI of £1.50 gets you that long-term ROI of £3. Now, it wouldn't be a think box study without talking about TV, and we've highlighted TV in pink. Now, across all categories, TV has the greatest average potential long-term multiplier up at £2.50. And this compares very favorably when we look at it against radio, print, out of home, online display, and indeed online video, with a cross-category TV having the strongest long-term multiplier. And there's quite an interesting link when you look across the categories here in terms of how TV performs versus how some of the other categories, uh, some of the other media perform. If you think about you know, TV being 100% viewable most of the time, 
if you think about TV being on a big screen, about telling a story over 30 seconds, it, it kind of makes sense that it's changing those tastes, those preferences, and that loyalty over time versus some of the other channels. And when we go through by category, what we've done here is added the gray dots in, which are the, the average or category, and see how those categories change. And thinking about what Nick said earlier, FMCG is quite interesting. Because even though the short-term ROIs aren't the best, when we look at it versus other categories, the long-term multipliers, on average, perform better than the all-category average. So rather than having a long-term multiplier of £1.90, we have a long-term multiplier of £2.30 across media. TV, rather than having a long-term multiplier of £2.45, has a long-term multiplier of £2.80, and vice versa. And we can see, in fact, that in FMCG, out of home has the biggest long-term multiplier. And that's quite interesting, because again, if you remember back to Nick's stuff, the out of home short-term ROI was quite low. Now, obviously, if you've got a low short-term ROI and a good long-term multiplier, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best channel in the long term, but it does slightly shift that argument away from channels that don't have a good long-term impact, potentially in this case online display. And also we haven't included PPC, firstly to match the ubiquity work, but also because it doesn't have a long-term multiply from the stuff that we've seen, if you move away from that to stuff that actually drives long-term success. And we look at retail. Retail t in total performs better, TV performs better, but actually you get a poorer performance from things like radio and print, out of home doesn't perform as strongly as it does um, within the FMCG space, um, but online video really works in the average retailer case that we're looking at. And I think radio is a really interesting example, again, going back to Nick's uh, piece of work, where we're talking about radio as an activation channel, which has really strong short-term ROIs, but maybe doesn't quite drive the long-term success of something like TV or online video. And then to wrap up, we're looking at financial services. Again, an interesting picture. But here we see online video scaled back and TV scaled back slightly. Interestingly about financial services, obviously, there's the loyalty takes longer to play out, whereas in an FMCG, you can become loyal within a period of months. Um, within financial services, it takes years to become loyal to something, and potentially that affects the results. And I am so glad that Nick did such a good job of explaining interquartile ranges, because there's one coming up for you now. But what we've got here is the interquartile range for the long-term multipliers, where when we see in totality, the range goes from £1.50 to £2.20. What we see again is TV not only has the highest low point, it also has a very high high point. So TV, in terms of long-term success, is one of the safest risks in terms of media investment. And when we look at it across everything, you can actually see that TV is the safest risk. Something like VOD has a, has a massive range um, due, to the, due to the variability that we can see in performance in that channel. Something like print or radio has a smaller range, but the, the lower point is lower. So I, I promised Cliff Richard, and I appreciate for some people this might be controversial, but the reason Cliff Richard is here is that he is the only person, singer, act, musical band, to have a number one in every decade since the charts began. He is tremendously consistent. It might not be a great consistency, but he's great, very consistent, and he, he perseveres. And the reason for showing this is, you know, we wanted to delve behind why TV works and what makes TV work into the, in the long term. And when we looked at our study, we stacked up the results versus a load of different factors and different kind of shared and, and not shared capabilities. What we found was that two biggest driving points for long-term success were consistency and perseverance. That's consistency of message and persevering with the campaign over time. You know, you think of that Galaxy campaign that went on for three or four years recently. And this completely kind of blows open that argument of campaigns that are planned, executed, and finished within a six-month time frame. They're not according to our study, the kind of campaigns that are actually going to deliver long-term success. So it's definitely worth bearing that one in mind. We also looked, we also looked at how the long-term plays out. 
So I completely appreciate that we've thrown a load of numbers at you. We've thrown away long-term multipliers. And obviously, we work with our clients to define these long-term multipliers. Appreciate not everyone in here is one of our clients, and, and that's fine. But um, the, what we want to give you is a way of understanding how that jam tomorrow can be played out in terms of jam today. What are some of the leading indicators for long-term brand success? And again, when we looked at all the data and all the analysis, the two that came to us first were an increased brand health and reduced price sensitivity. So an increase in brand health today can have a positive impact on your base sales tomorrow. Likewise, a reduced sensitivity to price from your consumers today can have a long-term positive brand impact in the future. And so these are tangible things that the CFO can look at today that indicates that there's long-term future success. And when we looked at brand health, for around 65% of the, the clients we work with, consideration was the strongest measure of brand health. And we found that a one percentage point rise in consideration is equivalent to a 0.5 to 1.5 percentage point uplift in base sales. So, which is great if you're a growing brand with growing consideration, but you can also flip this around to say that actually a 1% fall in consideration is equivalent to a 0.5 or 1.5% fall in base sales. And often for a lot of the brands that we work with who've been established for a long time, it's not necessarily about making that base grow. It's just as important to keep that consideration and that base stable and consistent where it is. And likewise, um, with price sensitivity, one of the things we found was actually a share of voice increase of 10%, which I appreciate is a, is a large number, can cause a 5 to 20% decrease in price sensitivity over time. And really showing that that E share of voice is a strong metric for things like price sensitivity. And so here's our, our headlines. Short-termism is undoubtedly harming the bottom line because we're not seeing the full impact of our marketing and media investments. We need to, as an industry, take a long-term view. Because the long-term effect of media is significant, but not only is it significant, it's different across categories, media channels, and brands within those categories. As a rule, and as an average, TV drives the highest long-term multiplier. Out of home and online video can be successful in certain categories, but certain channels do not drive the same long-term multiplier that TV drives. Perseverance and consistency are key to upping this long-term multiplier. So whenever you're looking at dropping a media plan after five months, just think of Cliff Richard. And brand health and price elasticity are the greatest short-term lead indicators for long-term impact. But I'm going to say this, that you can't beat a modeled view. So with those headlines, I'm going to hand back to Nick, who's going to look at how it all comes together to show how the short-term and the long-term can work to drive success. Um, I really didn't have you down as a Cliff Richard fan. Um, the 2018 calendar is available, apparently. Uh, OK, so. As Matt was saying, um, this section, quite excitedly, fuses together uh, the pieces of the data that I presented uh, and the data that Matt uh, presented uh, a short while ago. To understand what um, TV and the other media lines are doing, not just in that short to medium term, but also <laughs> across a longer-term lens as well. But as a reminder of where, more or less, I left it, take you back to this very, very glorious bubble chart, which where we plotted share of budget, short-term ROI, and the, and the share of return. And as a reminder, TV delivers about 62% of the share of the return. The other thing to cast your eye on is that y-axis. Uh, in terms of when I build now to the next slide and factor in those long-term multipliers, you can see how everything shifts northwards. Um, all bar one media line is now above break-even, so 
jam today includes the jam tomorrow, but that's quantified. The ROI for TV moves to a very, very attractive uh, £4.20 profit return investment. That compares to like a print to 243, online video 235, radio 209 at a home, which does deserve a mention here, goes above payback at 115, and online display at, uh, at, at 84. The other thing to cast your eye on, on the previous slide when I said the share return for TV was 62, that now shifts to, to 71. Now, obviously the overall scale of profitability increases because you are quantifying the long-term benefit. But in terms of that share of profitability, TV takes a, a greater share of, of that pie. However, to provide an illustration of how that profitability pie grows, um, kind of hit you with some more bar charts. Um, if we look across FMCG, financial services, and retail for uh, an average annual spend across those different sectors uh, for the channels in consideration, and then we chart up the, the net profitability uh, on average. So in terms of financial services, in terms of retail, that is net profit making as per the kind of the short and medium term ROIs that I presented a little bit earlier on. And obviously, the, probably the, the bone of contention was around FMCG, um, you know, where in the short term, it's very much the emphasis of let's hope it builds the brand in the future and suppresses price elasticities, elasticities et cetera. However, when then we factor in Matt's work and build in the long-term multipliers, you can see the story changes. And we have added on top the red part of the bar chart, which is that long-term effect um, from advertising, from TV advertising. So for, for retail and financial services, yes, that, that profitability stretches uh, quite nicely. But importantly, the crucial one here would be FMCG, where you get from profit eroding territory in that short to medium term uh, to a profit enhancing territory, which obviously makes compelling reading to, to CFOs. Right, some more response curves, I do apologize, but obviously when, earlier on when I presented the optimizations and the optimizations were uh, built off uh, profit return curves, here I'm gonna hit you with some more. So, here we have on the x-axis spend and the y-axis profit return, but then netted off the spend. So for the blue line, you, anything before the dot is profit enhancing. Anything post of that dot is profit eroding. When we factor in the long-term uh, multipliers, it has the effect of gravitating that blue line up to the green line. And importantly, the dot the, the blue dot and the green dot, the green dot moves over. So what it does mean is that once you build in the long-term lens, you can spend a bit more and spend a bit more with confidence and shifts that tipping point to the right-hand side of that chart. So we've reconstructed the sales response curves, built in the long-term multipliers, done that at a channel level, done that at a sector level, rerun the optimizations to get a view where TV spend should go. So again, taking the long-term lens, what is the right size? What, what, what is the right size for TV investment or share spend of TV? I'm going to hit you with a couple more bar charts. If we look at retail, that was the sector where, in the short term, we said probably there's a little bit of a tweak down to be had in terms of share of spend. As a reminder, on the x-axis, we have the percentage share of TV in the campaign. On the, uh, so on the x-axis, on the y-axis, we have an index campaign. The blue bar was the short-term view or short-term campaign ROI. And the green bar is the index campaign ROI once we factor in that long-term multiplier. And you can see that the green bars are higher than the blue bars at higher levels of investment. What that does mean is that versus a current share of about 55% in retail, in the short term, the recommendation was about 50. Factoring in the long-term view, that shifts the recommendation higher, up to somewhere between 60 and 70 percent. So let's now try and bring this together, provide a summary of the optimization data that we've talked about across the course of this presentation, and done that for the three sectors where we have an overlap between the different data sets.
So FMCG, uh, financial services and retail. On the left-hand side, we have the current state of the nation in terms of the share of spend of TV against the, the channels that we're talking about today. The middle set of boxes would be the short-term only view. So you can see that FMCG is up, uh, financial services is up, but actually uh, retail is down. And then the right-hand side, then, we have the short and long-term view, which uh, across all three would be a recommendation to increase spend uh, to, a, to a decent sum. So what we thought would be quite an interesting exercise is to take this data and then extrapolate that to all advertising spend uh, across those sectors to understand what is the opportunity. So what is the size of the price? We've taken another data set, which would be our Ubiquiti portfolio data, data set, which tracks advertising spend across the key channels. And therefore, we can understand what is the benefit, not just to businesses, but also UK PLC. So to give you an idea of that scale, by right-sizing the investment, it is about a £450 million opportunity in profit, which is a not an insignificant number. That represents around about a 12% improvement. And at that stage, I, I realize I've hit, I, I never thought I'd talk so much about optimizations. Um, I'm going to hand you back to, um, to Andrew, who's going to take you through the final few slides of, uh, of the presentation. The end is in sight. Um, you've had um, bubble charts. Bar charts, diminishing returns charts, uh, we've had Cliff Richard, we've had Radiohead, we've had Celine Dion, uh, and now we have Chalk and Cheese. Uh, Matt mentioned the challenge of talking the language of uh, the finance department of the CFO. Chalk and Cheese, CMOs and CFOs, CFOs and CMOs. I'm not going to allocate either of them to Chalk or Cheese. Um, and I know some people say this is not an issue. Everybody's getting along quite happily. Uh, just a few headlines from a few surveys, however. November 2014, I realize that's three years ago now. But in Marketing Week, the headline was Fluffy and Weak, What CFOs Think of Marketers. In the same year, Ernst & Young did a survey of 652 CFOs and they identified three barriers to collaboration. Number one, the lack of common tools and process. Number two, the absence of clear KPIs linking financial performance and the marketing activity. Seems to be familiar. And the third one, cultural differences. Clearly one group preferring Celine Dion to Cliff Richard. Um, a more recent survey this year by Alocadia surveyed 200 plus marketing organizations, and showed that those which had aligned marketing and finance were getting significantly better financial business results. Uh, and a lovely quote, finance likes predictability. They also like profitability, which of course is the name of this event. And what responsible ROI provides is a roadmap towards that. So the big takeaway from this is how do you turn all of the stuff that you've heard for the last hour or so into a roadmap that is going to move the dial and improve brand and business performance? And it's quite simple. As we said earlier, responsible ROI, which focuses on profit, but on scalable profit, short and long-term measurement, but not just, here's a multiplier, it's two or three times, done in a more rigorous way, and optimization of the type that Nick has talked about for brand and business growth. And that truly is the end of all of these slides and all of these different chart types. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Thank you.